The Thirty Years' War was a, a, a struggle over the political and religious order over this colourful area on the map, the Holy Roman Empire, Europe's largest uh, state at the time. And we're going to be focusing particularly on Bohemia, uh, which is where the defenestration of Prague took place precisely 400 years today, uh, 400 years ago. Ro we're probably about five hours late. It seems to have been about uh, nine o'clock in the morning Central European time. Uh, but nonetheless, we're marking this anniversary uh, today. And I'll be saying um, a fair bit about this map, um, but particularly this is the boundary, the red line, and the sort of mustard areas are the areas that belong to the, to the Austrian Habsburgs. And it's three of their officials that were thrown out of the window in Prague Castle, led by uh, Heinrich Matthias Thurn, a party of disgruntled Bohemian aristocrats forced their way into the meeting chamber in Prague Castle, uh, where the councillors uh, who represented uh, the Habsburg monarch, um, Archduke Ferdinand, uh, who was absent, were debating uh, uh, their future policy. Finding most of their targets absent, the angry Bohemians seized uh, two of the councillors, Willem Slavata and Jaroslav Borita von Martinitz, the two that they held most responsible for a series of policies that had been implemented over the previous year. After a short altercation, both of these were bundled swiftly out of the window, so swiftly in fact that several of those present really didn't know what was, what was going on. They're actually thrown out of the same window, uh, which is... Um, that one there, uh, not out of two separate windows as the contemporary, the famous contemporary engraving shows. And they were followed shortly thereafter by their secretary, Philip Fabricius. You can see him uh, there in the middle. Uh, he's thrown out really as a kind of afterthought. Um, <laughs> but amazingly, despite some injuries, all three of them survived the fall. And Fabricius was able to race to Vienna to warn um, the emperor uh, Emperor Matthias, who was the over, overlord of the entire em empire. And Fabricius, for this, for this feat, was subsequently ennobled as von Hohenfall, which means from the high fall. <laughs> of course, this was a, this was a deliberately staged uh, uh, event, and I'll say something uh, in, in a moment about the reasons why this took place. Uh, but it was, of course, hugely controversial. It was intended to be as such, and it produced um, diverging uh, interpretations. You see on, the, uh, on this side of the screen here, this is the Habsburg Catholic interpretation of how the three individuals survived the fall. Um, the Madonna unfurls her cloak. One of them does cry out, uh, Maria, as he falls, and she responds by um, saving the three of them, these three diminutive black figures. In the sort of Bohemian Protestant version, they land in a rubbish heap. Um, what's likely to have happened is they actually slide most of the distance down. They, they, it was actually a much colder day. Uh, they were, were all wearing um, thick cloaks and clothing, and uh, you may remember from the previous slide, uh, there is a slope, so they basically bang onto the slope and slip into the ditch. This event uh, starts a war that lasts 30 years, and it's a war that is primarily about the Holy Roman Empire, but it draws in uh, pretty much the rest of Europe. Other European countries are drawn in either directly because they become belligerents, Spain, France, Denmark, Sweden, and uh, Transylvania, which is now part of Romania, uh, which was then an autonomous principality, or indirectly, as in the case of Britain, the Dutch Republic, Poland, Lithuania, the Ottoman Empire, the papacy, and various Italian states, all of which supplied either troops or, or finance. This war is related to a series of other wars which are going on at the same time, the most important of which was uh, known as the uh, Eighty Years' War or Dutch Revolt. This is the revolt of the Northern Netherlands against Spanish rule. At the same time, as a sequence of wars in France uh, known as the uh, French Wars of Religion. And if you think of the Three Musketeers, this is set in that era uh, of the rebellions of the Huguenots uh, and their struggle for uh, or political and religious autonomy within France. Alongside that, there are wars that 
Britain fights against France and Spain, rivalry in the Baltic, a major conflict between France and the Spanish monarchy, which begins during the Thirty Years' War, is related to it, and ends uh, some considerable time afterwards. And of course, there are other kind of connections between these struggles, not just um, diplomatic. If we think of our own civil wars, many of the soldiers who fought in the civil wars in Britain had had direct experience, and Prince Rupert, one of the commanders, is somebody who's directly bound up uh, through his own family. We'll meet his family uh, again. We think of him as Rupert. He's actually christened Ruprecht, uh, uh, harking back uh, to one of the German kings that his family were trying to uh, recapture uh, the influence and so on that they had once had. So the question is really, why are we marking this today? Why are we here today? What is the significance of this conflict? What does it mean? So I want to say something about that. Um, then I'm going to concentrate really on the causes. Why is it that uh, this event in Bohemia leads to such a long struggle? So what causes the war? And then uh, briefly what I will say something about why it lasts so long and how it ends. What I want to do is really try to place the defenestration into context. The conventional view and the one that's most accessible in popular books will suggest that rather like Luther nailing his 95 thesis um, uh, a century or so before, um, the defenestration is event that uh, uh, the spark that ignites the tinder. This is one of the uh, metaphors that's commonly used. And so in other words, we seem to be uh, some, an event that starts a seemingly inevitable war. And what I want to do is I want to say that it is actually the culmination of much more specific and immediate factors. So the real question is why do the contemporaries fail to contain what should have remained uh, a localised crisis and stop it, uh, first of all, from spreading and then secondly from uh, continuing for so long. So why are we talking about it uh, today? Uh, and why do we remember this war from 400 years ago? Well, it's the most destructive conflict in European history prior to the two uh, 20th century world wars. Probably, the estimates vary, but probably around 5 million people in the empire died. The overall reduction of the empire's population was around about a fifth, although that took place over a much longer period, obviously, than the Second World War. To put that into perspective, the proportional loss of the Soviet Union in the Second World War, the country that lost the highest proportion of its population, was 12% compared, as I say, to about 20% in the empire. And we have to remember that we're talking about a pre-industrial age where it was much more difficult to replace the missing human labor with machinery. And there is a, a, an inordinately long and slow recovery. Um, the pre-war population levels were not really recovered until around about 65 years later, or so until the beginning of the 18th century. And this is one of the things that helped embed um, the war in uh, the memory of people at the time and sort of subsequent generations. The scale and the persistence of the destruction etched this war into the memory as a kind of benchmark conflict to which later wars were then to be measured. And it entered the uh, central European consciousness as a traumatic event far exceeding later disasters. So just to give you one example, in opinion surveys uh, conducted in Germany after the Second World War, Germans placed the Thirty Years' War ahead of Nazism or the Black Death as their country's greatest disaster. And the horror stories from the war were kept alive, um, kept alive in folk tales and embedded in um, literature. Um, Johann Jakob Christoffel von Grimmelshausen wrote a semi-autobiographical no uh, novel. He was caught up in the war himself and served as a soldier, and he published The Adventures of Simplicissimus um, uh, sometime after the war. He's also the person who creates the, the figure Mother Courage, who of course is then later reworked by, by Brecht. And the discovery, or rather the rediscovery of Grimmelshausen's 
um, literature at the, towards the end of the 18th century inspired um, other German writers, um, notably um, Schiller, um, who wrote uh, both a general history of the war, which is still in print, as well as a drama trilogy about the imperial general Wallenstein. And this, um, again, uh, keeping this alive in the popular consciousness, uh, this was made into the most expensive TV production of West German television in the um, 1970s, and uh, there are um, more documentaries and docudramas uh, either in production or being shown at the moment. So we have this idea that this is, a, this is as I say, a, a major conflict. And all of this has heightened the, the idea that it is a, a, a profound historical event. It's become a marker for key changes in European and indeed in world history. It's associated, for example, with wider shifts in other developments, such as economic change, the shift towards a more capitalist form of production, for example, or in military practice with the notion of the military revolution, that somehow warfare was being transformed uh, during this period. And it's seen as um, the birth of a modern international order, the peace of Westphalia. Politicians today are talk about the world as the Westphalian system, composed of sovereign uh, states, sovereign national states, which supposedly originates in the peace treaty uh, settling the Thirty Years' War. And lastly, it's seen as a culmination of a whole age of religious wars. And again, commentators referring to the um, situation in the Middle East have often said that uh, the problems there are the, due to the fact that that part of the world hasn't somehow had its Westphalian moment to supposedly to take religion out of politics. So let's turn then to the actual causes of this war. And there, are, of course, there are numerous interpretations. And what I want to do is really um, concentrate on just one, the leading one, which is, in other words, that this is somehow, as I say, a religious war. And what I want to do is I want to put religion into its perspective. So I want to go into some of the context about how people at the time thought about religion and how religious issues were bound up with a whole host of other uh, problems. Because we need to get away from the um, simple idea that we, we tend to have uh, about a religious war, uh, which is somehow sharply distinguished from secular issues. The empire was the first European state to have to deal with the problem of the Reformation. Luther, you can see here from a painting in the, made in the 1560s after his death. Um, Luther, of course, came from Saxony, which was in the heart of the empire. Uh, and so it was the empire that dealt, first of all, with the political fallout uh, of what became a permanent schism in Western Christianity. The Reformation posed a fundamental problem because it broke the unity of faith and law. There were now competing versions of what constituted the true religion, which of course then meant there were competing versions of what was truth. And early modern Europeans were simply not prepared to accept that. They wanted one truth as the source of all legitimacy, as the source uh, for morality, as the basis for law and uh, the foundation for politics. And toleration, with that frame of mind, toleration in our modern concept was impossible because it, it entailed recognizing the potential validity of opposing views. Thus, for early modern Europeans, toleration was basically a license to serve the devil. If you tolerated uh, opposing views, uh, you were endangering your own salvation. So most European states employed what can be described as a monarchical solution to this problem. So we're very familiar in this country with the process of the Reformation under Henry VIII, where basically it's the monarch that decides which of the various competing versions uh, of Christianity is the right one, and then uses political authority to impose this. And any um, uh, uh, toleration is basically a very much limited uh, special dispensation for uh, dissenters. Now this solution is, was hugely, um, was politically explosive. On the one hand, it represented an enormous increase in the power of the central authorities. 
the monarchy was getting to decide what was essentially a matter previously left to the church, what was true doctrine. And also, if you held a faith, a view that was different from that of your monarch, you immediately became a political subversive. And this is why religion indeed was a, a, a crucial factor in the civil wars that were uh, engulfed much of Western Europe in the second half of the 16th century, those in the Netherlands and in France, and those that affected uh, parts of Europe in the first half of the 17th century, including, of course, uh, Britain and its civil wars. The empire, however, adopted a different solution to this problem. Enshrined in the Peace of Augsburg, which was agreed in 1555. This is actually a commemorative engraving made a hundred years later. And this agreement extended legal recognition to Lutherans as well as Catholics. And it devolved the decision about which faith, which of these two equally, legally, equally uh, um, faiths, official faiths, it devolved the uh, decision about which of those could be adopted to the princes that ruled the various territories that collectively made up the empire. In other words, the empire's solution to the religious problem reflected its own political character as a mixed monarchy. It was a state in which the emperor was head of the empire, but had to share the exercise of key powers with the princes and also to a lesser extent with the imperial cities. Now, generally this settlement, the Peace of Augsburg, has been presented as simply a truce, postponing the seemingly inevitable conflict, which then makes, as I say, the defenestration as that spark igniting the tinder. And yet if we stand back from this, as I indicated at the beginning, this is a, a turbulent age where much of Western Europe is engulfed in religiously inflected civil wars, and yet this doesn't happen in the empire. In fact, the period from 1555 until the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War, 63 years, is the longest period of peace in modern German history, only surpassed in 2008 by the period since 1945. And Yes, there are some disturbances in the empire, they're localised, and there is nothing on the scale of what is happening elsewhere. For example, the massacre of St. Bartholomew, um, one of the key events of the French Wars of Religion, in which at least 10,000 people were killed across France. There is nothing like this in the empire. And more importantly, when war broke out, when it did in 1618, the belligerents within the empire and um, surrounding the empire do not line up neatly along confessional lines. In fact, most of the German Lutheran princes struggled to remain neutral, and those that didn't, some of those that didn't, uh, in fact, sided with the uh, emperor from the Catholic Habsburg family. The Calvinists, Germany's equivalent of the Puritans, who had emerged after 1560, did in fact largely oppose the emperor, but individual Calvinists, such as the gentleman whose effigy you can see here, uh, Count uh, uh, Hutzalpfel, um, individual Calvinists like this, like him, um, served in the Imperial Army. In fact, he is one of the commanders of the Imperial Army um, just before the end uh, of the Thirty Years' War. And the man who lets the defenestrators into uh, Prague Castle and the castle captain was in fact a Catholic. And we can um, enumerate numerous other examples where things on the ground are much more mixed up. But the same is also true for the international dimension. Yes, Catholic Spain supports the emperor, but does so inconsistently. Um, Catholic France backs a, a succession of Protestant um, protagonists within the empire, um, culminating with Sweden, uh, and then ultimately becomes involved uh, itself fighting the emperor. And perhaps more fundamentally still, none of the authorities, including the churches, call for a holy war. Everyone uh, tries to fight this war conventionally with uh, paid professional soldiers rather than trying to mobilize their own subjects. So what we're looking at then is that the role of religion is complex. It was very much a matter of perspective. Some people certainly saw this as a religious war. Many of the clergy and those who were driven into exile um, reflect on this and express feelings uh, that, are, that are very much 
would be those of uh, a religious war. But religion mainly served as a rallying call, something that could be used to persuade others, certainly other countries, that really your cause was the same as theirs and they should come and help. We should not, however, I'd say, uh, misinterpret this to mean that religion was simply an excuse. Uh, it was not used simply to mask what were otherwise secular aims. Rather, it was that the actors and most of the actors, most of those involved, regarded religious goals as something that was more, were more distant and were much more pragmatic about how uh, they were to pursue them. Okay, so if we stand back from this and we, and we see that this is not in any simple way caused by religion, what does cause this conflict? Well, the root cause is rather a paradox. It lies in the emperor, empire's character as a uh, mixed monarchy. So the very thing that enabled the empire to stand away and aside from um, religious violence actually leads to a constitutional conflict. And the problem was not so much the basic structure, it wasn't uh, the fact that the empire was a mixed monarchy, um, it, it, something that was heavily criticised by 19th and early 20th century historians who sort of blamed the outbreak of the war on the empire's weakness. Rather, it was that some of the key players within this complicated uh, patchwork wanted uh, not to adjust the system itself, but to adjust their own position or to tinker with it to suit themselves. And the problem was really that the shares of power within the empire were unevenly distributed amongst the princes. Some at the top uh, wanted rather more power, um, and in particular, um, two members of another family, the Wittelsbach family, the empire's second family after the Habsburgs, were divided. Um, we have here um, uh, Prince Rupert's father, Frederick V, the Elector Palatine, the man who marries uh, James I's daughter, Elizabeth. Um, and he wishes to recover his family's traditional influence, which is why he names his son after the last member of the family who had been a German king. And his relation, um, Duke Maximilian of Bavaria, um, wishes to improve his position, he's the, um, from the junior branch of the family and wishes to improve his position within, in, within the empire. And there's a whole host of other minor princes, counts and knights, all who felt disadvantaged in what was a hierarchical um, structure. And they wished to level some of these distinctions. They wished the empire to be much more uh, structured along the lines of an aristocracy where they wouldn't be bossed around by the princes ruling the big principalities. And part of the problem was that religious differences sharpened some of these political and constitutional issues. The Elector Palatine was a Calvinist, so technically then an adherent of a faith that was illegal with, under the imperial constitution, whereas Maximilian was a Catholic. But the religious differences nonetheless never did, uh, never intervened in a way that um, totally polarised uh, politics or split the empire neatly into confessional camps. Maximilian, for example, wanted to improve his own position, but not that of the Catholic Habsburg family who held the imperial title. So what was it then, you might ask, that they are actually arguing over? What is it uh, that concerned them? Well, the primary issue was the fate of the so-called church lands. It is, after all, the Holy Roman Empire, and one-seventh of the empire was composed of ecclesiastical principalities, where the ruler of each principality was chosen by the cathedral or the abbey chapter. So these principalities belonged to the Catholic Church and didn't belong to any particular family. And you can see them, um, they're marked here, they're, this, this map separates them all out. They're the purple areas, um, so they're the ones here, and those of you who've got um, good colour eyesight will notice that some of them are missing from the top because this is from 1648, some of those lands get swallowed up in the peace settlement. The problem was that these lands have been regarded traditionally since the early Middle Ages as the preserves of the major princely and aristocratic families. You have younger sons, you have daughters, 
uh, once you've married them off, once you have enough to ensure your hereditary succession in your own principality, what do you do with the spares? You create, you um, get uh, careers for them in the imperial church where they have the status of a prince and they can also then advance your own family influence. This had been going on for, for centuries and the Protestant families were simply not prepared to pass up on these opportunities just because they had converted to Lutheranism. And they also quite rightly feared that if these lands remained permanently in their grasp of the Catholics, then they would be permanently outvoted in the imperial institutions because although they were individually small, there were a lot of these lands, so it gave the, potentially gave the Catholics an inbuilt political uh, majority in the empire's institutions. So this in itself was not sufficient, however, to cause a major conflict. After all, the empire had been grappling with this problem for 50 years or 60 years or so before uh, the Thirty Years War breaks out. So we need to look further into this wider context. And the other key factor in the mix is the weakness or relative weakness within the uh, Habsburg dynasty. Although the princes collectively had considerable influence in the empire, they lacked the final say in important matters which still rested with the emperor. And since the early 15th century, the senior princes, the so-called electors, had always chosen a member of the Habsburg family as emperor. The Habsburgs had the most land, they ruled directly around about one third of the empire, and since the early 16th century that included Bohemia. And so they were well placed to carry out their primary task, which was to defend the empire against the ever-present threat posed by the Ottoman Turks to the southeast. Unfortunately, the, partici uh, the, par the partition of the Habsburg possessions into separate Spanish and Austrian branches in the middle of the 16th century had left the Austrian branch technically the most senior because they're the ones with the imperial title. It had left them the poor relations. The kings of Spain kept the uh, overseas colonies with their supplies of silver, and Austria was, relatively um, speaking, uh, the poor relation. And the Austrian Habsburgs needed money to pay for um, the border defences, which you can see this is a section, so this purpley area is the southeast corner of their territories. This area is the Ottoman uh, possessions and they have this tiny strip of Hungary which they'd held on to uh, where their border defences uh, were and that consumed pretty much the bulk of their uh, ordinary revenue. They had to appeal to their own nobility um, who were represented in the different assemblies of their provinces for further taxes and as these nobles converted to Protestantism they bargained um, political autonomy and religious rights in return for tax grants that were paid in fact by their peasants. Even more concessions were granted um, during the so-called Brothers' Quarrel between about 1608 and 1611 when the Austrian Habsburgs imploded over a succession dispute um, over this man here, Emperor Rudolf II. He was perfectly capable of fathering children, unfortunately none of them legitimately, uh, and his refusal to marry and to uh, uh, designate his successor opened up a succession dispute. Thus, the emperor was permanently distracted at the time when this dispute was growing over who should have access to the Catholic church lands in the empire. And yet, there was still no inevitable slide to war. The Bohemian crisis stemmed, in fact, not simply from weakness, but actually a relative revival in Habsburg strength, which began uh, with um, Emperor Matthias, uh, and continued with his successor designate from the Styrian branch, Archduke Thir Ferdinand, who had been made Bohemian king uh, in 1617. Ferdinand in particular sought to reassert his family's power by uh, making Catholicism a test for political loyalty. Protestants were not immediately removed from office, uh, but new appointments to court and military posts were now reserved for Catholics, 
And the leading Protestant nobles in Bohemia felt threatened by this, um, particularly the, the, uh, a, a minority who were directly losing out. Turn, the leader of the defenestrators, had just lost a lucrative court post. He'd been compensated with another one. But these were people who felt that they were on the back foot uh, and they were concerned that the moderate majority of nobles were not going to take a tough enough stand. So they wanted to push things to an open breach, to force a confrontation, which is why they staged the defenestration. However, neither they nor the Habsburgs wanted a protracted conflict, and both parties hoped that an initial show of strength would be sufficient to end uh, the crisis. So the, we're left with the question then of why it took 30 years to resolve this. And then to understand this, we need to think ourselves back into what uh, the principal actors were trying to achieve. We need to examine what their objectives were. And for Ferdinand and for his successor, Ferdinand III, they were kind of not very original when it came to children's names. Um, this was not really a war, this was a rebellion. As rebels, their opponents were automatically in the wrong. They had forfeited their rights. And thus the Habsburgs felt entitled to deprive them of their titles and their property whenever they could. And it was the near unbroken string of victories that the Habsburgs achieved during the 1620s that made this possible. And these victories began with the battle that you can see here, the Battle of White Mountain uh, in November of 1620, fought just outside Prague, which crushed the Bohemian Revolt, drove Frederick V um, into exile, and initiated the largest transfer of private property in Central Europe prior to the expropriation, ironically, of the descendants of the beneficiaries by the communists uh, after 1948. To give you an indication of the scale, half of all Moravians changed landlords as a result of the seizures from uh, those who had supported, uh, the no nobles who had supported the rebellion and their transfer of these lands to those nobles uh, who had remained loyal or to compensate army officers who couldn't be paid. So the Habsburgs regained control of their own lands. Remember, they had been largely opposed by their nobility prior to the war. Now those assemblies were packed with families who owed their own good fortune to having stayed loyal to the Habsburgs. And it's really this alliance that cements and stabilizes the Habsburg monarchy until it collapsed in the wake of uh, the First World War. And what the Habsburgs do is that they roll this policy out uh, to the rest of the empire uh, when they defeat um, each successive opponent within the empire, beginning with Frederick V. Um, you can see here a contemporary cartoon. He's looking rather sick, uh, traveling on a barrel. Uh, he's mocked as the winter king. His reign in Bohemia lasts barely more than a winter. Um, once he's driven into exile, his lands, which are the purpley bits here, are transferred to Duke Maximilian of Bavaria who provides the bulk of the troops that win the Battle of White Mountain. So the problem is that these moves, this policy creates a large number of embittered exiles. We have the Bohemian, the Austrian and the German nobles, all who lose their lands uh, in the wake of their, these defeats. Thus, any power intervening in the empire had a ready pool of support. Um, people who were uh, able to raise troops to facilitate that intervention, but also people who provided uh, a cause to legitimate that intervention. Um, e each of the foreign powers intervening uh, said that they were there not to conquer, but to restore what they claimed to be the proper balance within the empire. So now we can understand how this war, which begins as a crisis in Bohemia, spreads to the rest of the empire, uh, assumes the character of a more general European conflict. The supporters of Habsburg Austria want this war to be over quickly, especially Spain, related to the Austrian Habsburgs, of course, and who are facing a similar rebellion uh, in the northern Netherlands. So the Spanish provide military assistance 
um, not primarily to extinguish Protestantism in the empire. They actually want the emperor to make concessions. All they want is this war to be over quickly so that Austria can assist them against the Dutch. And of course, that gives the Dutch a very good reason to make sure the Thirty Years' War lasts as long as possible. So they provide financial assistance, especially to the Bohemians. And France, who the feared encirclement from the Spanish Habsburg lands, copies Dutch policy, and the French back anyone who is going to intervene in the empire to try and keep this war going as long as possible to ensure that there, there isn't a sort of full Spanish-Austrian alliance. The Danes, who intervene first as the first major European power to intervene, um, actually have a stake in the empire. They have a stake in these German church, church lands. They're playing the same game as the princes. Um, once they're defeated by 1629, um, uh, this opens up, in fact, opportunities for Sweden. It creates, um, the Swedes have their own problems. They're at loggerheads with the um, family ruling Poland. Uh, and they are concerned that the Polish uh, Vasas will form uh, an alliance with the emperor and therefore they're intervening largely out of security concerns. And when um, this gentleman here, Gustavus Adolphus, um, the king of Sweden, after his death in 1632, the war is essentially stalemated until the Battle of Nördlingen uh, two years later when it looks as if Sweden is about to collapse. And so the French, who have been providing financial assistance to the Swedes, fear that the emperor at last will gain a complete and outright victory, so they intervene incrementally to keep the war going uh, and to prevent that. The further reason for the um, long duration of this conflict uh, are a succession of military factors. Uh, a host of practical uh, uh, factors, including the accumulative effects of destruction, um, hinder uh, military operations. Um, military operations are usually shown as this sort of tangled web. Here we have, this has been reconstructed from um, a contemporary diary by a man who is probably called Peter Hagendorf. Um, unfortunately, the first pages of the diary and the last pages of the diary are missing, so we can't be certain. But he tramps 22,000 kilometers around the empire, um, serving in the um, uh, Catholic League forces. Um, so usually you get the idea that um, the, the war snakes around in this way. In fact, we have to imagine the war um, has been fought in different regions. And so the conflict becomes regionalized as a series of struggles between the main prot protagonists backed by their local supporters in each region. And so the problem is that a victory in one region is usually offset by a defeat in another. So it's very difficult to gain the overall military preponderance in this. And um, the war is linked very much to diplomatic um, moves to try and settle it. What the belligerents are trying to do is to uh, not to exterminate their opponents, but to use military force to compel their opponents to make what was considered an honorable peace. In other words, a peace that would involve um, concessions uh, that would uh, establish the basis for a lasting peace that would adjust of course, things in your favor, but nonetheless would mean that you could accommodate yourself with, the, with your uh, previous enemy. And so military operations are about gaining a sufficient advantage so that when you make peace and you have to hand over concessions, it doesn't look as if this is coming from a sign of weakness. And it's the problem about getting that right, that right balance. Ultimately, France and Sweden are able to evolve a military partnership that um, targets the emperor's supporters, so successively they knock out the different principalities that have been backing the emperor. And Emperor Ferdinand III, who succeeded his rather more intransigent father, Ferdinand II, skillfully offers just enough concessions to persuade France and Sweden uh, that they have more to, to gain by making peace now in 1648, uh, rather than risking losing these gains and fighting on. Uh, unfortunately for the, the peacemakers of Europe, um, France and Spain felt, both felt that they had sufficient uh, um, advantages to continue fighting and they end up fighting another 11 years, their own separate war, um, 
to settle basically for terms that were on the table in 1648 with very little change. So what is the outcome then of um, 30 years of fighting? Well, the general uh, picture is usually presented as a Protestant victory because much of the history of the war was written by pro-Protestant historians in the 19th century. Certainly, Calvinism was recognised as a third official religion within the empire, but by 1648 it was largely spent as a religious movement. We have to remember this is the middle of the 17th century, this is the age of the Baroque, and across the next um, 50 years or so, uh, around 50 German princes convert from Protestantism to Catholicism. It is Catholicism that is the dynamic um, cultural, indeed political force. It's the Austrian Habsburgs that emerge as a major great power through defeating the Turks outside Vienna in 1683 and reconquering Hungary. So um, the recognition of Calvinism is not so much uh, a, a, a Protestant gain, particularly when we also remember that the Calvinists had made most of their conversions at the Lutherans' expense, and the Lutherans bitterly resented, many Lutherans bitterly resented this uh, acceptance of Calvinism uh, within the empire. In terms of the territorial redistribution, um, you'll see here, this is a map of the empire in 1648, and it looks pretty much like the empire in 1618. Um, you can see here shaded the various areas that get um, exchanged. It's not so much of a, of a grand exchange of territory. Sweden does gain um, lands, they're the ones shown here in, in yellow, uh, which actually make it a, a member of the empire. Um, consolidates Sweden's power uh, in the Baltic, but that uh, is going to end uh, at the beginning of the 18th century with um, the emergence, full emergence of Russia with Peter the Great. Um, what exercised German nationalists in the 19th century was the transfer of Austria's bit of Alsace uh, to France. Um, that was really not what the French were actually concerned about at the time. What was far more important was the promise written into the peace treaty that Austria would not help Spain in the ongoing war. So all of those things are of less uh, lasting impact than we might, than we might think. Um, what was perhaps more significant were the gains of the supposedly losing side. Bavaria, in fact, kept most of its gains at the Palatinate's expense uh, and remains a, a major player within the empire. The Habsburgs, importantly, kept the settlement that they had achieved in their own lands, which, as I say, stabilised their monarchy uh, in, into the 20th century. And the empire itself, is usually presented as being having left uh, an empty shell, the German princes supposedly being independent. Uh, in fact, um, the Peace of Westphalia um, actually curtailed uh, some of the princely rights. Princes could no longer change the confession uh, of their own territories. This was now permanently fixed. And to make that a workable settlement, um, the imperial constitution enshrined a whole wide range of personal rights um, for example, the right to bring up your children in a different faith uh, and all kinds of other um, rights that were considerably ahead of those of other European countries. And the, with the complex constitutional adjustments that tend to get lost in the descriptions of the Peace of Westphalia that allowed the Habsburgs to rebalance their authority. Yes, their um, position in the empire had changed, uh, but they nonetheless remain uh, the leading power uh, in Central Europe and the empire survives into the early 19th century. The perceptions of this, though, were rather different. The, uh, it's a kind of two-track perception. Um, the idea of this as a truly dreadful event was certainly present and uh, kept alive. Um, it was kept alive in the official commemorations of the war, which begin immediately the, um, with, by about 1650. Uh, the Peace of Westphalia is being marked and has continued to be marked. Indeed, it's parts of Germany, it's still a public holiday. Um, and 
the memory of the war was of a truly terrible event that had been sent by God to punish the sins of the population. So in that sense, it was seen as a religious conflict. So the sinful Germans should be pious uh, and obedient uh, and diligent um, subjects of their princes. So part of the impact of the war was to increase um, princely power relative to the, to the uh, subjects. But in the longer term, this war is remembered as a national disaster, as something that, has been, uh, that had left Germany, used anachronistically, divided and weak, uh, and is therefore woven into explanations for um, the causes of later conflicts. Thank you.